Of course, trade restrictions uh, by China and other countries present an obstacle at this stage, but by no means an insuperable one, even if there is no regulatory change in China itself. But through um, trade negotiations, as the opportunities begin to become greater for us to operate in countries across the region, uh, these, I believe, will represent significant new wealth generators for our respective economies. Principle number two. Principle number three uh, is that uh, when we also uh, look at uh, how we engage Asia in the future, we should not simply focus on a single country, nor should we focus on a single product or service area. It's important for our respective economies to achieve what I would describe as balance between focus and diversification. Why do I say that? Well, if you've been watching the newspapers recently in terms of security events unfolding on the Korean Peninsula, uh, which is uh, something I've been doing for the last 30 years, the truth is that while in Asia we see these extraordinary uh, outpouring of uh, growth and economic activity these last 30, 35 years, uh, and rising living standards and rising export markets and emerging large pools of investable capital for the global economy, at the same time as these forces of economic globalization are transforming the face of modern Asia, we still have across Asia a positively 19th century set of political and security policy realities. Conflicting territorial claims on the Korean Peninsula, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and across the Taiwan Straits, not to mention India and Kashmir and some points in between. My overall point to you, therefore, is because there is something called geostrategic risk, it is important, therefore, that, in, that intelligent economies and firms, corporations, diversify their target countries. Also, to make sure that we simply don't land all of our eggs into a single basket. There's often an assumption that in terms of complementarities with China, uh, for example, from Canada and Australia, that it is largely an energy and resources phenomenon. If you look at the evolution of um, the peak in demand for Chinese uh, imports of energy and raw materials, you cannot make robust long-term assumptions that this is going to be some infinite curve heading in a direction of 45 degrees uh, on the graph. Uh, what you can see, frankly, the 19, in the 2020s is this beginning to peak and to flatten and to turn, as has happened with any other developing economy anywhere in the world. And therefore, the absolute importance for us to look as countries and economies to the other wealth generators as well food security, food supplies, agriculture, uh, precision manufacturers, new materials research, what we do in biotechnology, what we do in information technology, and across this, the high, whole spectrum of the services sector as well. Principle number three. There's only three to go, and then I'm going to stop. Principle number four is something which we in the political class often overlook entirely. Use your universities well. Here in BC, you have a world-class university. It's called the University of British Columbia. Anyone here from the university this morning? Okay. Therefore, I don't know why I should say something nice about them. There's no one here from the university. But if you look at the, um, the Times um, world rankings uh, of uh, global universities, uh, University of British Columbia is, uh, is up there together with the University of Queensland, in my home state, as uh, two of the world's top 100 universities. In that ranking, we Australians have six, you Canadians have four. And uh, of that 10, two lie in our respective home states and home provinces. Why do I say that? Across developing Asia, there is a premium opportunity and the demand for what these universities offer in terms of globally accredited and credible academic qualifications. And to build on that in terms of the networks of alumni which come through them intelligently, creatively, and for the future. And to see our universities as, frankly, the anchors of associated research and development activity and corporate activity as well. This is very much how the countries of Asia view the role of universities. It's how we need to view the role of universities as well. And you are blessed with a good one here. We are blessed with them in Australia. Use them to the full. Principle number four. Principle number five, I've mentioned already, on which I won't elaborate further. Languages. If you produce in this country, Canada, in this province of British Columbia, first-class economists, first-class lawyers, first-class accountants, first-class engineers, and at the same time you are producing 
MBAs where those graduates also have first-class skills in Chinese, in Bahasa Indonesia, in also uh, the, uh, in Japanese and the other languages of the region, you're then cooking with gas. If you produce through your universities a, a, a cadre of graduates into the future who are double disciplines, fantastic at what they do in the law, fantastic about what they do in engineering, fantastic at what they do in, frankly, um, entertainment management facilities, but at the same time, they are competent in the language of the region. Frankly, it puts you ahead of any European competitor or, frankly, competitor from the United States. The assumption that English will be the global lingua franca by the end of this century is itself an arrogant assumption. English has only been the global lingua franca since English-speaking countries triumphed in World War II. That's not all that long ago. At least you guys in Canada have an advantage, you speak too. Uh, in the rest of uh, the uh, English-speaking world, that is usually not the case. But frankly, if you do that well, you'll equip yourselves well for the future as well. And so my recommendation is for your graduates from universities, take, get them, once they've graduated, to take a year out or two years out in one of the best language schools in Asia to acquire that second set of disciplines. And principle number five is this. It is consistency. It's all very well to produce uh, government white papers, as we've done in Australia through the Asia Australia in the Asia Century white paper in the last six months. What the countries of Asia, what the cultures of Asia, the business cultures and the political cultures look for is consistency and continuity over time. There is an intrinsic reaction to people simply coming for a five-minute opportunity as to becoming long-term business partners, personal friends, and those with whom you do business over decades, not just a single transaction over a weekend. And in that, governments have a central role. It is the hemisphere where the role of government is still central. Whether you're talking about robust democracies like the Republic of Korea, you're talking about communist states like the People's Republic of China, or you're talking about the emerging dynamo which is Indonesia, or the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, governments across Asia play a central role. Therefore, it is important for our national governments and our provincial governments to engage those governments within the framework of policy consistency, within a policy framework of long-term engagement with their countries and economies so they do not simply see us as fair-weather friends. That is my fifth and final principle. I look forward to the conversation with you. Great to be back in Canada. I hope we can have an enriching conversation in the remaining time we have this morning.